the simplicity of the gospel. to start a series talking about Jesus. So for the next week or two, you're going to be hearing most of our sermons about Jesus. You know, one of the writers said that if all the things that Jesus did, if all those things were written in the book, then the whole earth would not be able to contain as many books as you could fill up with those. So he did a lot of stuff. So we're going to pick up some things that he wanted to share with you. So, and Adam, Ready? Welcome to the simplicity of the gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. A church that is making it difficult for you to go to hell. If you go to hell, it's your own choice. Because if you come here, you can't say you didn't hear. If you came to this church, you can't say you don't know. Because whenever you come, you're going to get something from the word of God. We've been speaking for quite a bit. Some of you might even get tired with it right now. But we were talking about the coming of the Lord. Let me, look, let me take another bite at that. I'm not preaching about this this morning. But give me 15 minutes to recap. I'm starting at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation. Don't forget the word grace means unmerited favor. You can't demand it. You can't work for it. It is grace. So the grace of God that brings salvation. When you see salvation, you think of being saved. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. But it has appeared to all men, nobody has any excuse. You end up in hell, you end up not serving the Lord, you can't say you didn't know. Because the grace of God, something that you don't really deserve, has appeared unto all men. And that grace teaches us a number of things. Number one, it teaches us that we should deny ungodliness. There's still a lot of ungodly living, even in the church. We should deny worldly desires. Oh my God, that has gone so far. Uh, and also, not only that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lust, but we should live soberly. Keep your thinking cap on, don't behave, don't live like you're drunk. We should live soberly, we should live righteously, doing the right things. Some people think that not doing bad things is living righteously. But not doing bad things is only half of it. Doing right things is the other half. So you could not do certain bad things. You don't commit adultery, you don't steal whatever, and you think you're righteous, not necessarily. You got to do the other side. You got to do this and do that and love one another and all that. We should live righteously and godly. Our lives should be like God. We as Christians should look, at, look like square pegs and wrong holes because we are not doing what the other people are doing. Uh, and, and the last four words there, stay there for a little while, in this present world, sometimes some Christians are so heavily minded that they are no earthly good. But we should do all these things in this present world. Now this is where we're going to get to our text now in the next verse. Our next verse tells us that while we're doing all of that, we're looking. Have you been looking today? We're looking for that blessed hope. What is the blessed hope that we're looking for? The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming again, brethren. He's coming in glory and all the things that we think these days are really fabulous. When we look at pyrotechnics and when we look at, when we hear sound and all that, and we put together these, like, you know, uh, like I always say, the Miss Universe peasantry and all that, we think that the presentation is so marvelous. When Jesus, come back to the verse, when Jesus comes, all of that is going to pale. So we're looking for, we're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. It's going to be wonderful. All the trouble that you would have gone through in this life, it would be worth it while you're well to bear it with it. Because when you die and you're with the Lord, you're going to say, Ooh, I'm so glad that he made it. I'm so glad that he made it. So we're looking for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Who gave himself for us on the cross of Calvary. Why? That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Thirdly, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Let me show you that he's coming. For those of you who don't read the Bible and those of you who don't know, let me go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to begin at verse 11. Jesus is coming, brethren, and all the evil that can be heaped upon you now is not going to be worth it when you see Jesus. One glimpse of his dear face, all the things that you go through now will erase. You could be so glad that you fought. 
You're going to be so glad that you shut your mouth. You'll be so glad that you didn't take vengeance. You didn't exact vengeance on somebody. You'll be so glad that you followed the word of God, even though it was difficult. Verse 13. Okay. Verse, look at, this is talking about the coming of the Lord. But I will not have you, brethren, to be ignorant concerning those that are asleep. The word asleep means dead. That you sorrow not, like people who don't have any hope. After we die, there's still hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, you know the resurrection, even so, those who sleep in Jesus, they died as Christians. Even those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. Your body is going to be eaten by maggots up in the cemetery, but it is coming back one of these days. God is going to bring with him. Look what is going to happen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, because the rapture could take place before he finish his sermon, we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, we are not going to precede those that are dead. Look how it's going to work. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, we don't know which one, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, those who went to the cemetery, they're dead, but they're going to rise first. Your body's coming back. They're going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, remain saved. We'll be caught up, raptured. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Brethren, he's coming. In Revelation chapter 22, I think it says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man Everybody say every man. According as his work shall be. Stop talking nonsense. But you can't serve God. You can't go to church. Because the people in there is hypocrites. You are going to give God an account. According to your own works. Let me read it one more time. Behold I come quickly and my reward is with me. To give every man. Pope, pauper, politician. Everybody. To give him according as his work. This is personal, brethren. When you hear people talk nonsense and say, I can't go to church because the pastor this and the pastor that. Yeah, the pastor must be this, but the pastor must be that. But when he put his head on his pillow at night, he repents and asks God to forgive him. And he's on his way to glory. And you out there like a fool going to hell because, because the pastor did this and because the pastor did that. And because them people down there are hypocrites. Man, you're going to... You know what the Bible says? The Bible said that hell has enlarged its mouth. God even had to enlarge hell because so many people are going there. And that is not a place where you drink rum and coke and eat bread and and we eat bread and fish or even caviar is a place of torment are you understand what I'm saying can I hear amen you're going to be rewarded according as your work shall be so while we wait for the coming of the Lord I gave you eight things that you should be doing my five minutes is going up just now I gave you eight things that you should be doing I could have given you 800 but it would be a waste of time so number one, while you're waiting and looking for the Lord, spend time with God regularly. Turn off the idiot box, the television. All right? And spend time with the Lord. You don't have to be by your bed kneeling down. You could be driving in your car. Roll up the windows, turn on the air conditioner, and keep talking with God. You could sing it. You could talk it. You could groan it. You could whatever. But spend time with God regularly. Otherwise, you can backslide. Number two, maintain an attitude of hope the word hope means confident expectation expect that the Lord is going to come expect the Lord to come before you get back home today expect it that's hope hope means a confident expectation hope is not I hope that the bus comes at 11 o'clock that's not Bible hope Bible hope is a confident expectation is a sister to the word faith you believe it's going to happen number three you've got to continue serving God you can't say but well, God is coming so I'm not going to go to university anymore the Lord is coming so I'm not going to send my children to, to, to education anymore I'm not going to send them to football and all that because the Lord is coming no 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 you've got to keep you got to continue to serve God number four keep living a natural life when the Lord is ready to come he's going to come 
Number five, reflect on the goodness of God in your life. That's a good catalyst to push you forward. Reflecting on the goodness, that's what we sang this morning. Uh, uh, when I think of the goodness of God, amen? So you reflect on the goodness of God. Number six, you look for lessons from God. As you're reading, look for lessons from God. What is the Lord trying to teach me in this situation? Uh, what has is, what is happened in this situation? Why am I here? Why? So you look for answers. Number seven, don't take matters into your own hand because you can do that and forget all about God. You, be, you can become vindictive. You can become, come to a place where you want to pay back this and pay back that. No. But number eight is the last one we did. And this will become note tomorrow, hopefully. Number eight, while you're waiting for the coming of the Lord, be excellent in whatever you do. Be excellent. And we talk about persons with an excellent spirit. Daniel and Daniel chapter 5 and verse 12. He was going to be promoted because he had an excellent spirit. The word spirit can also be translated attitude. And there's some folk even in church that don't have an excellent attitude, but they have a nasty attitude. You're not going to heaven with God. You need to be, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge was found in him. Excellent spirit. Do you have an excellent spirit? Are you approachable? Are you likable? He had an excellent spirit. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 3, you'll see again that Darius wanted to promote Daniel above, uh, above 120 persons that he set in charge. Be, he wanted to promote Daniel um, because an excellent spirit was found in him. When you go to work, and no matter where you're working, you are not going to be promoted if you don't have an excellent spirit. You can have a degree, you can have more degrees than a thermometer. It doesn't matter if you don't have an excellent spirit. If you're not a people's person, you ain't going nowhere. And you'll be surprised that people come and have less qual uh, paper qualifications than you, and yet they're promoted above you. It's because you have... Well, somebody down the back say a nasty spirit. Huh? Nasty spirit. We also look... Uh, the word, uh, 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 the, the Proverbs 31, the woman who we call the virtuous woman. She was a woman with an excellent spirit. Take time to read and see what she did. The word excellent speaks of, uh, uh, of greatness. It speaks of the very best. Uh, it, excellence is a quality that people really appreciate because it's hard to find. Excellence is the quality of excelling. When somebody is excellent, there's certain words, when, when somebody or something is excellent, you, there are certain words that you hear associated with them all the time. Very good, superb, outstanding, magnificent, of high quality, exceptional, marvelous, wonderful, perfect. Those are words. First class, superior, splendid, top notch. Those are the words that are associated with people that are excellent. But on the other hand, if it's not excellent, you hear words like terrible, poor, bad, crude, inferior, insignificant, second class, second rate, regular, pitiful, paltry, ugly. This side of the fence you're on. So the Bible tells us in Philippians 1 and 10, I hope I have the right scripture, that we should approve things that are excellent. We want everything to be done in this church to be done with excellence. There's it. You may approve things that are excellent, not mediocre. Your life, the way you dress. You don't dress nice to come down to church, down, down to church and then when you're going downtown, um, you don't look so nice. You don't comb your hair. You don't put it, you forget your hair home and forget the eyelashes home and things like that. You want to look excellent. Did I hear amen? So I give you eight things that you ought to be doing. But let's go back to Philippians chapter, uh, to take this chapter two one more time. And it says that we're looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Why are we looking for the glorious appearance of Jesus Christ? Why are we not looking for Hitler to come back? Why are we not looking for Peter, Paul, or Mary? Why are we looking for Jesus? Because there's something exceptional about this Jesus. We're looking for Jesus to come back. Now, so my text today, my text is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. Although I'm going to go back to verse 1 to give you this in context. Verse 23, Paul said that 
we preach Jesus crucified. My topic this morning is we preach Jesus. And I've been reflecting. And I don't think that in the last 400 sermons that I did in this church, I don't forget I could do 200 sermons a year in this church, I did not really preach on Jesus. I preached on Peter, Paul, and Mary. I preached on Elijah and Elisha. I preached on the devil and demons. I preached on everybody else. And the main purpose, the main person that we should be preaching about, I have not preached about for a long time. That is Jesus. Don't forget the gospel is about Jesus. If you don't preach about Jesus, you're not preaching the gospel, you know. If you preach about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're not preaching the gospel. If you preach about Elijah and Elisha and Jezebel and all them, you're not preaching the gospel. The gospel is the gospel of Jesus. Here Paul saying to, to Timothy, for I am not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of, finish it for me, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. If you're going to be saved, you have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let me remind you that we have an attitude that when we meet ungodly people and we want to talk to them about Jesus, we usually tell them about how bad they are. You got to get saved, you're a drunkard, you're a whoremonger and all that. No, no, no. The Bible says that it is the goodness of God, bring up the scripture, it is the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So you're witnessing to somebody, you're not telling them how bad they are, they know that already. You don't have to remind them how bad they are. But you need to tell them about the goodness of God. That's why when I see people in the congregation, whether it be a funeral or whatever, and I don't know whether you know Jesus or not, you know that there are certain things that I'm going to be talking about, like you heard already this morning. Uh, listen, not knowing at the end that the goodness of God, the goodness. So you talk to the ungodly man about how good God is. I have some funerals coming, back, coming up shortly, and that's what I plan to do. Rather than telling the congregation, look there, you're going to burn in hell, like I usually do. <laughs> I'm going to twist it this time. I'm going, to, I'm going to work another method this time. I'm going to tell them about how good God is. You understand? God is real, real good. It is the goodness of God. Don't go there and tell the lady she's a whoremonger. She knows that. She doesn't want to be, but she got to feed children. And she ain't got another job. And the children are hungry. Let's understand. We don't agree with her, but we understand what she's doing. Can you understand what she's doing? She got four children and she ain't got nobody supporting her. You know, the four fathers gone. And she thinks that the only way to make some money is to go down by the garrison. Oh, don't, don't cry down the woman. We ain't agree with her. But we're not going to cry down, amen? Let's talk about Jesus. But before we go there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that church, like all churches, had some problems with the members. Let me read the first 23 verses. Because what the Bible says is more important than anything that I could say. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and to Sosthenes, our brother. He's writing to the church in verse 2 that is at Corinth. He's writing to them that are sanctified. The word sanctified means separated unto God. It means holy in Christ Jesus. They are called to be saints. We don't have to wait for the Roman Catholic Church to make us saints. We are already called to be saints. With all that in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said to this church, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you greet each other when you come to church? How, how do we greet each other? So he said in verse 4 to the Corinthian church, I thank my God always on your behalf. When last did you thank God on behalf of the Pegwell Community Church? When last did you thank God on behalf of any particular person in the Pegwell Community Church? And the one that I think you should thank God on behalf of is the one that you don't like. Or the one that gives you trouble. Because if you let that fester, and if you let that grow, it could turn into hatred. It could turn into all kinds of nasty things that will make your candidate to, be, to drop out of the kingdom. So those ones who don't like you, that's why the Lord said that you should bless those who curse you and who persecute you. Huh? That's what you ought to do because there's, a, there, there's this thing in you that you could, you, could, you could come to hate. You could come to be a place where you're very angry. And that is not good for your spiritual life. So Paul said in verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. Notice something here about Jesus. He's the one who gives grace. Grace and truth came by Jesus. That in everything 
you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. Verse 5 is really powerful. It's saying this church is a powerful church. In a few verses, we're going to read that all the gifts of the Spirit operated in this church. But this church was so wicked. There was so much wickedness in this church, yet all the gifts operated. How is that possible? Because God gave you a gift. He's going to use you in that gifting for the benefit of the church. And if you are not living for God, don't fool yourself that because your gift is working, that your life is right with God. No, it is that God is confirming the gift. God is confirming his word. So we have evidence where some people came before Jesus and said, did we not cast out demons in your name? And in your name we did very many wonderful works. And what did the Lord say? The Lord said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So this church was not a church that you would want, probably want to go to. But all the gifts work. Verse 5. And everything you are enriched by him in everything. In all speech and in all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was concerned among you. So look at verse 7. This is what I'm talking about. He says to this church, so that you came behind in no gift. Tongues operated in this church. Interpretation of tongues operated in this church. The gift of miracles, healings, prophecies, all the gifts operated in the church. They came behind in no gift as they were waiting for the coming of the Lord. So you think the church was perfect? Let's read on. We are in verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. With the advent of YouTube and all that, churches are so fragmented. I say one thing for my puppet. You go home and you listen to your African preachers and they say something else. Now you don't know which one to believe. Because you don't know the Bible. You should not be listening to the African preachers everywhere because you don't know the Bible. It's like going to a doctor. The doctor could tell you anything because you don't know. The doctor could tell you anything because you don't know. It's whether you trust the doctor or not. You don't know. So these days, with all these preachers on television, you don't know who to believe. Because you don't know, you don't know what the Bible says. So we have, so we have preachers in Africa getting the members of their church to come church naked, bathing them naked on the platform, walking on the members because God told them not to walk on the floor, that they should walk on people. So people are in and they're walking on them. Sunday morning, God tell me to tell you that you should go there and eat grass. And big women out there with their nice six inch shoes and two inch eyelashes and mascara and all that. And they're out there kneeling down eating grass. Have you seen these pictures I'm talking about? Huh? Maybe you don't know the scriptures, so that's why you can believe what they say. You don't know the scriptures. Come here and learn the scriptures. So we are saying here that they came behind in no gift as they were waiting for the coming of the Lord. And you think that everything that you see on television is right and accurate. I've seen some that make my hair stand up like if I'm a white man. Yeah? Look at verse 8. Sorry, uh, verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren. So some persons told Paul some things that was going on in the church. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with you telling the pastor some things that's going on in the church either. Because the pastor can't know everything. Unless you're gossiping. If you tell me and tell me, pastor, don't say nothing, you're gossiping. Don't tell me. What help it is you're telling me if I can't do anything about it? You're just gossiping. You just want me to know something. I don't want my head got to be full with so many things that I can't fill my head with trash. If you say, Pastor, this is happening, but I don't want you to say nothing about it, what are you telling me for? What is the purpose you're telling me? Let me answer it for you. You're gossiping. So if you tell me something, you should tell me with the expectation that I'm going to do something about it. Especially with something that is for the benefit of the church. Amen. So I don't want to gossip. Let the Lord tell me what he has to tell me. But some people told, told Paul in, in verse 11, It has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by, by them that are in the house of Chloe. You see, Paul called the name and said, who tell him? Huh? In Sister Merle's house, they told me that you do this. In Sister John's house, they tell me that you do that. No, he called Sister John, no, she in cussing, and don't come back to church. Not so with Paul. Paul said, I heard from those who live in Chloe's house. 
Do you see that in verse 11? That there are contentions among you. He even pinpointed the person who told him that there are contentions. So with all the gifts operating in this church, there are still contentions. Look what was happening. Uh, some of them said, I follow in Paul. Verse 12. Others said, I'm following the assistant pastor, Apollos. Others said, I'm following Cephas. Cephas is Peter the rock. Others said, I'm following Christ. So you have four factions in this church. Four divisions. We must have got about ten boat here. Four divisions in this church. So Paul is addressing this. He said, is Christ divided? You all divided in four. Is Christ divided? Huh? He said, was Paul crucified for you? That you want to follow Paul? Huh? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Or in the name of Jesus? Huh? He said, I thank God I didn't baptize anybody but Crispus and Gaius. I didn't baptize anybody else. Lest you should say that I'm baptizing in my own name. Well, I, didn't really, I didn't realize that they used to falsely accuse the preachers in that day as well. He said, you will say baptize in my name, but I didn't baptize anybody other than Christmas. Verse 14, and Gaius. And I also baptize the house of Stephanus. And beside that, I don't know whether I baptize anybody else. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. I listened to somebody on uh, YouTube yesterday, vilifying, ridiculing, speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, that's a very integral part of church life. That's a gift that God gave to the church. God said, when you speak in tongues, you build up yourself. God said, when you speak in tongues, you don't got a clue what you're talking about, but you ain't speaking to yourself, you're speaking to me, and I understand. God said that you should not forgive people, forbid people from speaking in tongues. Let people speak in tongues. Yet, there are those who vilify speaking in tongues because they don't any better. So the preaching of the cross is to some that perish foolishness. Uh, to those who are saved, though, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. A anybody getting anything out of this? Yeah, I'm not hearing you. I just want to know so you can move on. Verse 90. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. I mean, let, let's jump down. Let's cut to the chase because of time. And go down to verse 23. He said, Paul said, all oh, this is happening in this church. Some fall in Peter, some fall in this body, next body. But as for me, we preach Jesus. So I want to preach Jesus. If the story of Jesus does not excite you, something is wrong. We preach Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Jesus is God, yet he's man. It is something that you are not going to understand. The Lord said, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so much higher are my thoughts above your thoughts. If God and I could understand the same thing, they won't have a need for want for both of us. If God and I understood everything, they won't have any need for both of us. Why? They don't want to. We don't understand what he understands. We don't know what he knows. So we've got to accept the fact that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And let me give you some scriptures. John chapter 1 verse 14. And the word, notice the capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the first begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you want an, an Old Testament scripture, Isaiah 9, 6 said that he should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. John chapter 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? So I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand we are talking about Jesus. Thank you, Queen, sir. All right. I'm trying to get you to understand we are talking about Jesus because Jesus now is a stone of stumbling to many. How many understand me? You all are unusually quiet. So we are looking for the return of this Jesus. This Jesus who is the only means of salvation. We're going we're gonna to stay here for the balance of the sermon. If you are going to be saved... If you're, going to be looking, if you're going to be looking for that blessed hope and you're looking for Jesus, you have to be saved. Is that, is that, is that amen? Is that amen with you? 
Let's look at the monk of scriptures. We could talk about Jesus, the name Jesus, which was a common name at the time when he lived. As a matter of fact, it's still a, 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 a common name in places like Puerto Rico. They don't say Jesus, but they say Jesus. It is spelled the same way. So Jesus was a common name. I could talk to you about the fact that he probably was not born on December the 25th. But who cares where the, where, what day he was born? We only want to know he was born. He probably was not born on December the 25th because you hardly have shepherds out there keeping watch over their sheep. And what would the sheep be eating? Snow? So he probably, but who cares? We don't care when he was born. We just want to know that he was born. Huh? I could probably tell you that there's a strange thing that the, uh, the life of Jesus separated B.C. and A.D. B.C. is before Christ. A.D. is... Why did they use the name Jesus and they didn't use Julius Caesar or somebody else? All right? And the strange thing about the birth of Jesus, if B.C. means before Christ, Jesus was born in the year 4 B.C. How many of you know that? In other words, Jesus was born four years before he was born. You look at me, you don't understand what I'm saying. Jesus was born, according to history, in 4 B.C. So he was born four years before he was born. Well, there was a confusion with the calendar. That's what it is. There was a confusion with the calendar. Then. So we could talk about that, but that is, uh, that is, that is mine. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, we could talk about the fact that um, Jesus is found in every book of the Bible. Jesus is found in every book of the Bible. In Genesis, he's the breath of life. In Exodus, he's the post Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. I mean, Jesus. Huh? In, in Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's the judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. We talked about Ruth uh, last uh, Thursday night. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our, our, our ever living redeemer. So Jesus is in every book of the Bible. When Philip went down and met with the Ethiopian eunuch, yeah, he was reading the scriptures. And the Bible said that John got in the chariot with him uh, and using the scriptures taught him about Jesus. He only had five books. The New Testament was not written then. He only had five books. And in those five books, name them for me, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. In those five books, you find Jesus. All right. Uh, after the crucifixion of Jesus, there were two people walking on the street, going back home, and Jesus appeared with them, came close to them, and began to talk to them, and they did not know it was Jesus. Jesus asked them, well, what's happening? And they said, you live out here, and you don't know what's going on. You know how Jesus was crucified and was raised up. They didn't know they're talking to the same Jesus. And then the Bible said that Jesus, using the same scriptures that they had, began to talk to them about Jesus. You didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You didn't have, you didn't have Samuel, King's Chronicles. I'm saying that in every book of the Bible, there is Jesus. You can find him every, everywhere. Either um, in type or in what you call theophanies. Have you ever heard the word theophanies? The word theophanies refer to an appearance of Jesus before he was born in the major. I mean a bodily form. A theophany in the Old Testament is the appearance of Jesus in body form even before he was born in the major. Because don't forget that Jesus did not begin in Mary's womb. Jesus did not begin in the major. Don't forget that Jesus was before all things and by him were all things made that was made, I think that's a Hebrews chapter 1, 3 or something like that. So Jesus created all things. You ask about the existence of Jesus, and no many people, not, not many people could explain it to you. Because if Jesus created the universe, he had to be outside of the universe in order to create it. Talk to me, somebody. This game too tough for you? He had to be outside in order to create it. So uh, we are not going to understand. That is why I have a lot of questions, Mel. I can be so glad to get there and got time with questions. I was going to say when they get to heaven, they have a lot, a lot of questions to ask. But you know what? Having worked so hard to get there, I don't think I got time to ask the questions. But we will know in the sweet by and by, we'll understand. We are looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. If it's going to benefit you, you're going to have 
to be saved. Listen to these scriptures. John 3.16. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that is Jesus, that whosoever believes in him, the world today is not believing in Jesus because of their educational status, because of them climbing up the social ladder, because of a lot of worldly things, people are not interested in Jesus today. Huh? People are not interested in Jesus. But he is the only savior of the world. There's no salvation in anybody else. I would like to sit down and talk to the intelligentsia of this country. Because they think because they have degrees and big cars that they owe for. And big houses that they owe mortgages on. They think that they have arrived. No. The Bible said in the book of Peter. That the earth is going to melt with a fervent heat one of these days. Watch it on the screen. The earth, your car is going to melt. Your house is going to melt. Your diploma is going to melt. Your whatever. Your fancy shoes. Victoria Secret stuff. It's all going to melt. Why put so much confidence in it? Use it while it's here. But look for that blessed hope. Everybody read with me. Read with me, please. Everybody. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What's going to happen? In the which the heavens will pass away with what? A great noise. Go ahead. And the element shall melt with a fervent heat. Go ahead. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be what? Burned up. Let's read that in the New Living Translation. A more modern translation. Everything that you know, as you can see today, is going to be burned up on these days. The only thing that's going to last is your relationship with Jesus Christ. But the devil is on a mission to make you think that we are crazy when we talk about Jesus. New Living Translation. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. He could come right now. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. And the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. It will all be burnt up. The only hope we have, brethren, is Jesus. So everybody's against Jesus because that's the world's job. If you talk about God, you have no problem. If you talk about Allah, you have no problem. If you talk about all the multiplicity of gods that you have today no problem but you say jesus you can get your head chopped off say jesus and there's a problem why look at Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. neither is there salvation in any other you're looking for the blessed hope if you're not saved don't look it's no benefit to you you got to be saved you got to be born again the Lord said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Neither is there salvation in any other. I'm talking about Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Some people in Acts chapter 16 verse 31 after they experience a miracle, they ask, what shall we do to be saved? Then they say, go to Caesar, or one of those other persons, or go to the synagogue and do this and do that. Look what was told to them. What must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and your house. Jesus is the only way. Look at this one. Jesus said, I think this might be, John 14, 26, I can't remember. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I am the way, see T-H-E, the definite article. Not I am a way. I made that point because people change this verse today. I am the way, the truth, the life. People now are teaching something called universalism. Universalism. That everybody that has been born is eventually going to be saved and go to heaven. That's what's being taught now. Everybody. Because God so loved the world. God loves everybody. He's going to bring them into heaven. God doesn't 
hate anybody, so he's going, he's, how could a loving God send people to hell forever, is the question that's being asked. By the time I finish this, this discourse on Jesus, you, would, you should be able to answer that question yourself. People say, how could Jesus punish, with, punish us with eternal hell? That the punishment doesn't fit the crime. How could you live on earth for 75 years? Live a life that's not pleasing to God. And then God banish you for all eternity. Well, that punishment doesn't fit the crime. You're over punishing. No. Not when you understand what God did for us. Not when you understand the opportunities. Not when you understand how Jesus was wounded for our transgression. And bruised for our iniquities. He was so beaten, the Bible says, that when they finished with him, his face did not even look like the face of a human being. He did that all for us. And he came and he let us know that he did that for us. He left the glories of heaven. He set aside being God and took on an earth suit. What a degrading step to come down. And then took our sins on himself. So much so that the father turned his back. And the same Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of that he did for us. Are you going to turn around and say the punishment doesn't fit the crime? If you know the price that he paid. He said, I am the way, T-H-E. So, when the Africans come with their preaching, and you want to live bad, you're going to accept what they say. Everybody going to hell anyway. That's why Paul said, or James, that we should earnestly contend for the gospel that we know. Don't change from what we know. Lots of people have gone to heaven on our gospel. We don't change it now because this is 2024. But you listen on the radio, you don't believe you're hearing the same gospel. You don't believe you're hearing the same gospel. God has no problem with, with two homosexuals being married and pastor in the church, they say. God has no problem with a hundred million babies being murdered since the 1960s when they passed that thing called Roe v. Wade. Huh? And made abortion, made abortion legal. And a hundred million babies have already died. Not died, no, sorry, pardon me. 100 million babies were already killed. And so you have a lot of marching today. This is our body. We are pro-choice. We choose whether we have the baby or not. The gospel is so mutilated. This, the gospel is so contaminated today. You won't believe that it is the same gospel. But, but J, Jude said that we should contend. If there's one person that's going to contend for the gospel and preach as though I'm living in 1910 it's going to be me I'm not going to change the gospel because you don't want to hear what the Lord says I'm going to contend the word contend means to fight you know to strike to fight to struggle I'm going to contend for the faith when T-H-E comes before faith the word faith now means doctrine or dogma I'm going to contend for the teaching the doctrine the dogma which was once Way back when, delivered to the saints. I'm not going for this modern stuff. That's why you see we don't have a lot of concerts here. Because they don't want ladies up here doing, doing liturgical dance and twerking. And you can see everything that they had for breakfast. I'm not going to do that because everybody's doing it. I'm not going to have ladies come to this microphone and the baby's starting to cry. Because they think it's feeding time. You don't get that? All the breasts exposed. The babies are crying. It's feeding time. No, no, no. We're not going to do that. So you want to pass away? We don't see them sort of things happening here. Because I'm earnestly contending for the faith. The Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. But I want a keyboard player. And the only one that's available got hair down to his waist. What are you going to do, pastor? You know what I can do? Start up, the, start up the, the, the computer. And play from the computer. The Bible said that women should be modestly attired. When you raise your hands and we're saying the hair under your arm that should have been shaven before you left home. Is that good? What sort of standards they have in the church today? Anybody listening to me? 
Oh, when they listen, you know? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What sort of standards do you have in church today? What sort of standards? Women are coming to church these days with distressed jeans and the cuts are all up here that you can almost see the bottom of their underwear. Why ought, why ought that ought to be in the pulpit? I am going to earnestly contend. Man, look, if we don't want to see, go to church, women can see that sort of thing. Not only are you fleshy, but their church is all wrong Barbados. I tell you, gonna be because when they first came here with my big fashion, say, if you want to come here, their church is wrong here that don't say what I say when I can go to them. And the people obeyed me. <laughs> and, and they went. And, and they went. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that again. But anyway, I don't know, y'all are unusually quiet this morning. But it's just like when you preach Jesus. Look, listen to this. Jude said that we should earnestly contend. I have 10 more minutes, you know. I have contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. The gospel that you're hearing today ain't no gospel at all. The gospel you hear today don't demand anything. No excellence, no holiness, no righteousness. But I want you to remember that the Bible says that Jesus, let me give you some more scriptures which show you that Jesus is the only way to salvation. We're going to finish. We started with Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So pastor, I mean that the world has two billion Muslims and all of them going to hell because they don't believe in Jesus? You can read, right? You see what that says, right? You see what it says up there, right? So the Lord is going to let two billion Muslims go to hell? Well, let me tell you what the scripture says. That there's not salvation in Allah, but there's salvation in no other name but Jesus. Listen, we went to Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, we, we went to John 46. I, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Acts chapter 2, verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord is Jesus. Jesus, put him back in your life. I'm disappointed that he's so far down the, down the pool. We hear more about Rasali and bread plastic bag than we hear about Jesus. And you can't deny that. We hear more about the activities in, 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 in the National Cultural Foundation than we hear what happened in the church. When last we heard something spectacular happened in the church. And God has given us the power to raise the dead, to cleanse the leper, to heal the sick. We have that power. It's ours. Jesus said the things that he did, we can do also. But we are indisciplined in church. We don't follow instructions from the pulpit. We don't follow what the Lord says. You are told to sit on one place, you sit on some place else. When you go to the cinema, they tell you to sit on, when you go in the airplane, they tell you to sit on here at 27C, you go sit on 27C, isn't it so? Talk to me, somebody. But in church, God doesn't, God doesn't operate with rebellious people, you know. God doesn't operate with rebellious people. Check the scripture and you'll see. But let me give you some more scriptures showing that you've got to depend on Jesus. Hebrews 9.28 So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. On Calvary he was offered to bear my sins and your sins. So it says, And unto them that look for him, Are you looking for him? Shall he appear the second time? He came the first time in a cave, in a manger. He's coming a second time Without sin, but unto salvation. He, Jesus, is coming a second time. Not an angel, a cherubim, a seraphim, Jesus himself. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 22. For as in Adam all died, yeah, so in Christ, not a Peter, Paul, or Mary, shall all be made alive. You're going to have eternal life only in Jesus. We are looking for that blessed hope. If you don't have eternal life, stop looking. Or better still, if you don't have eternal life, you can have it today. Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. For it is the power of God unto salvation. 
It is not your testimony that leads people to Jesus. According to this verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. Not that your testimony doesn't ever work. But that's not what leads people to the Lord. Jesus. Romans 5, 7 and 8. Verse 8 says, God commended. The word commended means demonstrated. God demonstrated his love towards us. In that, while we were still sinners. God didn't save us because we were goody goody to choose. While we were yet sinners. He commended. Notice that's commend, not command. God commended his love towards us. In that world we were yet sinners, who died for us? So when you go back home today and you hear this universalism, don't send me a clip telling me, Pastor, what do you think about this? Everybody going to heaven, I tell you not so. No. You got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so you'll be saved. Huh? Look at this text. Uh, John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through his son Jesus might be saved. Not through Allah. Not through any other God. Jesus is the only way. But that is not taught today. Go online, you'll see. People are, Oprah Winfrey came up with this some time ago, two, three years ago. It got some traction and it keeps going all the time. No, no. Jesus said, I am the door. Listen to the definite article all the time. T H E there. I am the door. Not a door or one door or another door. I am the only door. If any man enter in through this door, he'll be saved. Romans 5:10. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. Reconciled. You have a bank account, you get a bank statement. You notice that the balance in your checkbook is not the same as on the statement? You got to reconcile it. Well, to reconcile is to bring into agreement. So you got to put on the deposits that weren't made and take off the checks that didn't get to the bank yet and you reconcile. You with me? Anybody do a count in here? Do you understand? So how were we reconciled to God? There was a difference. Sin made the difference. So Romans 5 and 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, who is his son again? Jesus. Much more. Much more. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Who's the his? Jesus. Brethren, this is the way. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon what? Come on, man. Talk to me. Talk to me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah, Jesus is the only way. It doesn't matter whether you like him or not. And you know something? Life is so much easier when you come to know Jesus. I don't know if you all have noticed that. The Bible said the way of the transgressor is hard. The transgressor. But you serve God life, life. You know, what he's been telling me for the last two weeks or so, I'm saying in a new way. Although I preach this message time and time again. And there's a scripture that says, fear not, only believe. That's all it says. Bajan. Don't walk around being frightened and scared about things all the time. Just believe what the Lord says. What's so hard about that? The Lord said he will heal us. Just believe it. Don't walk around thinking you can get a heart attack. The Lord says he's our protector and our provider. Don't walk around thinking somebody might break in my house tonight. Or when I drive in going through silver sand, somebody might shoot at me. You can't walk around in fear all the time. You've got to know what God says and trust him that he's able to keep his word. So that text says, fear not. Only believe. Leave here today with that, if nothing else. You can't walk around with fear. Fear has torments, the Bible says. Fear not. Only believe what God says, so you have to know what God says. Let me give you two, three more scriptures, and I'm, I'm going to stop. Uh, uh, 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son, 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son, hath what? He that hath the Son, who's the Son? You notice that the word Sunday is capitalized. It has a capital S. It's speaking about Jesus. And by the way, when you write Jesus and things like that pertaining to God, you should always capitalize them. You can't write Allah without capitals, you know. And in their culture, you can't say God, you can't say Allah, except you say at the end, peace be unto him. Allah, peace be unto him. Have you heard it? Just showing some respect. 
He that hath the Son hath life. There's nobody else, brethren. Do what you can turn to turn to Jesus. Turn about all the other prophets and priests and all them, they're good. The apostles and everybody, they're good. But Jesus is the one we look to. He that hath not the Son hath not life. If you're here this morning, you don't have Jesus. Jesus has, is not your Savior. You do not have eternal life. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have eternal life. Uh, Philippians 3.20 says that our lifestyle is in heaven. From whence we look for the Savior. Who's the Savior? The Lord Jesus Christ. John 10.10 10, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have a what? More abundantly. And the last text I'm giving you today is John 3.36. We preach Jesus. We're talking to Jesus today. We are looking for that blessed hope. What's the blessed hope? The glorious appearing of Jesus. Are you looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus? You can only do that if you're saved. Are you a Muslim, a Hindu, or whatever, and you're looking for the appearing of Jesus? No, it doesn't work like that. There's only one. There's only one. He that believeth, uh, John uh, 3.36, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. I will take time today to dwell on the, on the word everlasting Man, the 60 or 70 years that you spent here, and you had hell with your mother-in-law and all the other people that you had hell with, it was so difficult. The sleepless nights. Maybe your body was racked with pain. You have some disease that is maybe incurable. Even if you had that for 100 years, you were a centurion. Brother, everlasting life. Everlasting life is forever. It's going to be worth it all when you see Jesus. Come to church and serve the Lord. Turn off the stove from cooking and washing. Come to the house of God. It is going to be worth it all when you see Jesus. He that believes on the Son has what kind of life? Everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son of Man, what, what it says? Shall not see life, but what? You go up to, you go up, to, uh, up to the Philippines and you're in a hammock. And you're just enjoying the breeze from the beach. You know, you're taking your caviar and all your nice stuff if you don't have Jesus. No, 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 no. It says God's wrath abides on you. The choice is yours today. We've been talking about looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Are you looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ? Are you born again? Do you know him? Bow your heads where you are. Talk to the Lord. And if you're here today, in the next five minutes or so, you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You can't say Jesus is your Lord. If he's not, the wrath of God abides on you. You don't want to get a heart attack when you leave here and die. You don't want to die not knowing Jesus with all these scriptures that I gave you just now. If you're here this morning, you don't know him. Why not come? Let's pray for you and with you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from eternal damnation. Saved from the lake of fire. Not even hell because hell is just a waiting place. Hell is going to give up the dead that are in them later on. At the judgment, hell is going to give up the dead. And they'll be consigned to the lake of fire. The lake of fire is forever. When, when Daniel's furnace was heated seven times hotter, you can understand how hot that is. Well, I saw online last week that in the pit of the earth, in the core of the earth, that the, that the fires, the heat, can reach over 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit in the core of the earth. They say the fire in the core, in the belly of the earth then, can reach over 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is what you will be in if you don't know Jesus Christ. Oh, well, I got my friends there, so we'll have some time to play some dominoes. Oh, yeah? Then the friends there. Anything that you could call Jesus would not be in hell. He's the bread of life. You won't find bread there. He's the water of life, you won't find water there. He's a friend of sinners, you won't find a friend, friend there. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that hell, that that place is the blackness of darkness. It is worse than when you go down to the cave. Anybody ever went down to the cave and they turn off all the lights? With, in the carriage under there, talk to me. And you know you can't even see your hand? Well, hell is going to be worse than that. You ain't going to see nobody. And then you can't stand up like I'm standing up here because the Bible said that hell is a bottomless pit. You want a place to put your feet on. So those who say, if I miss the rapture, 
If I miss it, it's going to be fine. I have friends there. We could go and we could, we could play some cricket for the balance of our life. No, 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 no. The Bible said it's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you don't have teeth, you'll probably gnash your gums. But it's not going to be. It's not going to be a luxurious place. You're not going to Sam Lord's. Is there anybody here today? You have not yet made a decision for the Lord. Let's stand and sing one for you. If you do not have a local assembly, feel free to join us for an exhilarating time of worship. Our services are Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Sunday evening, healing and deliverance at 6.30 p.m. Join us in prayer on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. and for Bible study on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Let's fellowship and enjoy the simplicity of the gospel.